Oh my God, I don't believe it. I put my finger through time and then I fell in and like I've ended it back in prehistoric times. I hope I haven't stepped on any butterflies and ruined everything for you there in the future. But if it's all the same, uh, hey, look, I'm doing the Edinburgh Fringe uh, this year at the Newtown Theatre. Every day is set Monday from the 2nd of August to 25th of August. You can already get tickets. Go to richhang.com slash gigs to find out where. Uh, I'm also on tour. Same address. Look out for that. And we've got... A, an amazing Kickstarter still going. We need to hit the target. We need to hit £50,000. It's going okay, but if we don't hit the target, we get nothing. If you like these videos and want to keep them going, we'll probably be releasing about 70 Rahelastopas this year. Not all of them on video, but m many of them, hopefully. And if you want us to carry on filming them, uh, then please donate just even a little bit, whatever you think. If you think those are worth 10p each, go and donate £7. But there's some amazing prizes uh, if I get back from the from the past I'm going to ring Andy from Andy's Dinosaur Adventures uh, see what he suggests if only I had time time it's Rahela Stepper with the wonderful London Hughes Welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who has just done a wee with no blood in it. It's Richard Herring. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, Leicester Square Theatre. Lovely to be back in the home of this podcast. Uh, welcome to Richard Herring's Lymphocyte Stimulation Test podcast. And of course, I don't need to tell you, this podcast is all going to be about measuring the ability of lymphotes to respond in vitro to an activation stimulus. That's what we're going to get all the guests out. <laughs> it's just a new direction. See how that goes down. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, uh, the diet's going OK. I've, uh, I've lost a, another pound. I'm an, over a stone gone now for a stone one stone one pound so that's uh i don't think my plan was to wear the suit that i wore in 2015 by the end of this series I'm not, it's not going fast enough we'll see or i might just wear it and let it break uh but uh, i've got a new prop that uh this is uh the audience have seen this this is my new cat this is my new cat uh baton de commandant it would have been called in the old days. It's just this is a little cane I'm going to just have just as a gimmick. It's a gimmick for my. You enjoy this, sir? Look, you lean on it. Oh, see? Yeah, you're loving it, aren't you? Didn't laugh. You were here last week. You didn't laugh at a thing. And then I just that. That's, that's all you need. Just a little twirl that around. This could really hurt someone. It's the one living in the front row. Yeah. Because you can. It like was pretending it was my penis. That, that, was, that was the. Because you can't do that, can you now? And then, now, now there's, you can't do that. Can't pretend a cane's a penis to a stranger anymore. Unless they want, do you want that? Yeah, she does want it, so it's fine. Fine. You have to ask first, mate. So, I'll just keep that there. George, the sound guy, wants this. He wants to take this home. He said, that's mine. Jess from the theatre said he could have that. He's got a very sad... It's a very sad life, George, George the incompetent sound guy, but it's nice. He'll go home tonight, he'll be lying in bed with that. Imagining it's my penis. You do not have my permission, George. You do not have my permission. So, good, we filled the time. It would have, it would have passed in any case, but not so quickly. It's a little uh, uh, quote from uh, Waiting for Godot. That's how... Uh, that's how classy we are. So, our guest this week, she's probably best known for being the woman in the sex shop in Fleabag. Come on, that's a pretty good credit. She's in Fleabag. Will you please welcome the amazing London Hughes, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. It's the cane. The cane does it every time. Yeah, we are filming this already. <laughs> <laughs> who's that? Who's that grey-haired bloke in the back? I know. Hey, who's that? This is old white dude. <laughs> 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 this is the audience, but you can't see them because it's dark. Make some noise so they know. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. There we go.
we go. <laughs> well, thank you for coming along. How are you, how are you doing? Make yourself at home. <laughs> Hello. You will have to you will have to talk into a microphone eventually. Though you're posting it now. Okay. This is this is what you get when you get youngsters on. You get youngsters on. I don't know, it's just beside you, I think. I can see a wire. There Hello. it is. Hello. Hey. Hi, guys. Thank you for staying. I was like, they're not going to stay for me after James. And you stayed. Thank you. Of course you. they stayed. Appreciate it. <laughs> What's the matter, babe? Of course they stayed. These, but they're, they're, there's some boys in a state of shock. <laughs> see, seeing a lady's shoulders. Some of them have never seen that much. <laughs> <laughs> They've never been happier in their life. So, woman in the sex shop in Fleetwood. Yeah, Bay. yeah. Do you want to know how that happened? Yeah, I want to know so, it, what we involved, what so happened. So, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, yeah. she's a badass. What happened was, she, I think she's a fa she was a fan of mine, okay. or I auditioned for another show that she did on Channel 4 called Crashing, oh, yes. and I didn't get it. She remembered my audition tape and was like, I'm just going to put this bitch in, Fleabag. <laughs> but at the time, Fleabag weren't Fleabag. It was just a show called Fleabag. And my agent rang me and was like, do you want to be in Fleabag? I was like, why? Why would I do that? And she was like, Olivia Coleman's in it. I was like, okay. <laughs> if it's good enough for Liv, do you know what I mean? I'll yeah. do it. And then I, I'm going to be real with you. I, didn't, I had no idea who Phoebe was. I yeah. knew that she wrote stuff, but I didn't know she had like a one-woman show. I didn't know anything about her. And she was just so lovely. And she was like, London, this is my middle-class white woman voice, London, I wish, I wish I could give you more, but it's just a small scene, but you're gonna kill it. And I was like, Phoebe, it's all right, it's TV, do you know what I mean? I'll take the money, do you know what I mean? <laughs> what else am I gonna do? And um, yeah, I did the scene, and it was me, her, Jamie Dimitri, and we were in a sex shop, and I had to flirt with her a little bit, and then I had to talk about this vibrator called the borrower. And, oh, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fun. And then after working with Phoebe, she like, she thought I was awesome, which is true that I am. Yeah, that is true. I've heard. And she just, she's can continued to be my friend in life. And now she's my home girl. She even signed my. So I've, you know, well, I'm a big deal now. And um, I just got signed in America. But to get signed in America, you have to get a visa and work out there. And Phoebe signed my visa thing to basically say I'd be an asset to the entertainment industry in America. Wow. She's such an awesome woman. I love her to bits. So, fantastic. Yeah, that's how Fleabag happened. Oh, brilliant. But I've only ever seen my episode. I heard it's good, though. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it's really good. It is very good. Is episode very three, good. that's me, episode three. I don't, I've only ever seen. I heard it's good, I heard it's really funny. You should watch it. It's on catch up. It's on catch up. You backstage were telling me that I'd chosen the wrong embarrassing. Well, you had another idea for. Yeah, for, uh, uh, for my embarrassing, embarrassing thing. thing. Yeah, um, I've always wanted to be famous, but for a real reason, not just like a reality reason. Like, I'm very talented and. <laughs> I was really talented. And um, I always tried, I was that girl that was trying to be on TV all the time. I auditioned for Big Brother four times. Um, the fourth time I actually got through, but I had to repeat. They told me if I went on that series, I would have had to repeat uni, the first year of uni again. And I chose education. Mm. And I said no. And the year was, do you remember when, who watches Big Brother here? Is anyone fans of Big Brother? No, when it was classy with Davina, not this new shit. The classy. <laughs> Davina Big Brother, classy Big Brother. Um, the, the year that Brian, black guy, Brian from, oh, yes. Essex, from Basildon, that year he won. I was, was supposed good. to be in the house that year and I turned that shit down. <laughs> but um, <laughs> apart from that, I also uh, had a, my first ever TV job was presenting Babe Station in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> These guys all watch it. They're, they're all, they've all seen it. That's why they're here. Babe Station in the daytime. <laughs> it's good. No, it sounds proper porny. It's not that porny. It's all right. So basically, imagine like <laughs> in the day, it's like Babe Station, because obviously the channel got to keep running, they got to pay bills, isn't it? But there's not allowed, you're not allowed nudity at four in the afternoon. So it's just me. So it's like live TV, and it's just me like, hi, you're watching Flat UK with London. And then you know at the bottom of the screen, you could like text in back in the day before iPhones were a thing, remember? And you could just text in like, and it said 073, and you text in at the bottom of the screen. You could do that, and then you could also send in your picture to me. So I'd be like, this is Rich, he likes black girls. If you think Rich is nice, text in. And then at the bottom, be like, hey Rich, ASL, which means age, sex, location. Yeah. And then like... Tell me. 
and then you would like yeah. talk through the TV. Yeah. It's called Flirt UK and it was £20 an hour and then at 11 o'clock, that's when the porn started. So I'd go off. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm out of there. I know my grandma's a Christian. I was out of there. But the porn stuff was crazy because the porny girls, they would be like normal girls and they'd be like, Work it and be like, oh, oh, fuck me, fuck me, but then be like, all right, babes, there's chicken nuggets in the fridge. Fuck me, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. It was so weird. They'd be on the phone to their kids, on the phone to the clients, kids, clients, kids, clients, and they would be, yeah, but I got the sack from that. Yeah, how come? Um, <laughs> so basically, what I, I was quite naive, I was 18, um, and I was really quite naive, and I'm really funny as a person, don't know if you can tell. And like, if you put a camera on me and it's live TV for how many hours, I'm gonna say some, I'm gonna think of content. So I started talking about my shoes. So I was like, today I'm wearing these shoes, da da da. And then guys would be like, yeah, yeah, put your feet up again. I'd be like, okay, this week I'm wearing these shoes. This week. And I didn't realize that foot fetishes was a thing, because I was 18. So guys were like wanking off to my feet on daytime. <laughs> Daytime Flirt UK. So yeah. my producer came in and was like, I need to talk to you about your content. Like, you can't do Hughesy shoes anymore because... <laughs> can't, can't do Hughesy shoes because people... There's foot fetishes and people are wanking off to you. They like it and you need to stop doing Hughesy shoes. So that was strike one. So I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop doing Hughesy shoes. And then I was like, why don't you send in stuff? So I'd get them to send in pictures and I'd make stories about the pictures. See, it was good. Four o'clock in the afternoon and you get me. Great content. Yeah. And people would send in a picture and I'd be like, this is Jim. And I'd make up a story about Jim. And we had this regular that always sent in pictures of himself. And Sky Plus had just been invented where you could pause the TV. And um, this guy, I, don't, I think it was Jim, I can't remember. He paused the TV with my face on it, got his dick out. <laughs> Can I say dick on this? You can say anything right, you like. Got his dick out. <laughs> put his dick next to my face and then took a picture of that. Got his friend to take a picture of that and then sent it in to me. And now back then, pixelation wasn't our friend, innit? Because it was all blurry. So I couldn't really tell that that was a picture of a dick in my mouth. I was just me. So I, I put the picture up. Like, stop. <laughs> so at four in the afternoon, if you were watching Sky Channel 872, you'd see me like this. With a dick in my mouth. <laughs> with a nice pink penis in my mouth um, for an afternoon. And then when I pull it up, you know when like you panic, because I saw I put it up, I was like, ah, 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 and I couldn't take it down, it was up there a bit too long. And then Ofcom found out. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they're there for. But why are you watching? Who's complaining about that? At four, what sad individual writes in, oh yeah, I was going, I was on Babe Station in the daytime <laughs> and I saw a, a dick in a, a girl's mouth. It's very respectable in the daytime. Do you know what I mean? It's just flirting in the daytime Shut shoes. In. And that's the thing. And because I already, I already did the whole who's the shoes thing and that was a debacle as it is, they were like, we can't have you, you're a liability. So they... <laughs> sacked me from basics. Did you go... But, did you go straight to CBeebies yes, after I that? <laughs> my next job, six months later, was CBBC. No bullshit. That was my next job. And I know some of the dads remembered me from another time. <laughs> okay. I, I bet you got weirder people on CBeebies than oh, you on Babe God. Station. Oh, my God. I'm even more of a, a sexual heartthrob in the kids' world. Weird. That sounded weird. <laughs> no, but you need to... <laughs> no, so... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it sounds weird. I'm not a paedophile. not a paedophile. Here's the thing. No, I just need to stress that. Keep that bit in. I'm oh, not, well, okay. not a pedophile. So, <laughs> it's going to be only that, London. That, yeah. That's the only one that's going to be in. <laughs> Not a pedophile. <laughs> People are saying you're a pedophile. I'm not a pedophile. Not a pedophile. <laughs> not a pedophile. Not a pedophile. No, there's a... There's, here's a... Wait, so... Yeah. On kids... <laughs> on kids TV, like, there's this whole taboo of, like, sexy kids presenter type thing. Mm. And I'm very fit. So I fit that. <laughs> so I fit that mold of like sexy kids presenter. Yeah. And when I was on CBBC, I just got all the weirdos just sending me stuff. And there was this one guy and he just wanted to, me to always wear satin trousers and rub my thighs. And he would send satin trousers to my agent and be like, can London please wear this on the show when she introduces Tracy Beaker? And I'm like, <laughs> so weird. So there was like satin thing. And then I recently found out guys, which I'm actually really excited about, I'm massive in the gunge fetish world. <laughs> like, at the gunge fetish is a thing. 
And my friend was on a date with this guy and she was, he was going through her Instagram and he saw a picture of me and her together and he was like, you know London Hughes? And she was like, well, obviously, like, obviously like, she's my friend. And I think she just thought, you know, he recognised me from TV because I'm a star. But here's the thing, <laughs> he recognised me from the Gunj websites. So when I was, um, I used to present a show called Scrambled on ITV and I used to get Gunj yeah. and these Gunj fetish people would like, rip the clips and pull it up and it's had hundreds of thousands of views and people love watching me get gunj i give good gunj and they'd be like they'd be like you'd read the comments and be like oh at 22 seconds when her mouth's open ah oh. and i'm like what people are sick in it <laughs> sick gunj i mean you'd be sacked from babe station that, that kind of thing yeah, it's allowed on cbb's sick with the gut, like proper light, and it's just, they slow it down, add music, make it all sexy, like a late night Channel 5 movie. Literally, it was disgusting, but also I was really flattered. <laughs> I was so flattered about that. It's so, a yeah. very powerful thing being a presenter on CBBS. I'm yeah. telling you, because you, what you've got, speaking from experience, yeah. is some very tired parents mm -hmm. uh, who have found themselves trapped in a terrible situation that they didn't yeah, like, they didn't want to have they didn't expect they and didn't, didn't know it was going to they thought it would be beautiful and it's horrible yeah and you know you're not seeing your partner because you're just working shifts at this job of raising a human being yeah and then these happy jolly innocent looking gunge covered <laughs> girls come on and it gets you know luckily uh, you were before my time yes. on CBeebies, so yes. if you were Rebecca from CBeebies, we'd be in trouble. Then. Really? Yeah. Oh, look at you're that. Fine. You're okay, fine. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, really happy about but that. But it kind of it's a sort of primeval because they, they're the only grown ups you see. In the oh, day. really? Yeah. Is that why? Yeah. So uh, you're, you're looking after babies and you're not really seeing your partner because you're taking it in shifts. So you're just wanking and over so, the kids' presenting. No, I mean, it's not even that mentally wanking over them but you're not <laughs> you don't have the energy to even actually masturbate oh, so no. it's just it's more you think these people are your friends not Andy from Andy's Dinosaur Adventures he can fuck right what off. Andy's great we love Andy fuck right off. Andy's wicked mate love Andy <laughs> <laughs> bless him yeah see BBC's crazy I've got stories now that I've left because they I say what the fuck I want. There's so much stuff that goes on there. Like, they have the best parties, like Blue Peter parties. Oh my God. Free bar, everyone throwing up on the one show so far. Like, it's mad. <laughs> it is mad. Every Thursday, a cart comes round at 4 p.m. They call it Wine Thursdays. I didn't start drinking until I became a CBBC presenter. <laughs> Literally, everyone's like, London, it's Wine Thursday. It's 4 o'clock. What are you drinking? And I'm like, I'm oh, babes. I just want the lemonade. And no, no. Down it, down it. And then I'm on live TV, like, coming up next is Skibby Day. Scat <laughs> and Skibby Day. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's a lot of fun, and your yeah. taxpayers pay for that shit, man. It's just. <laughs> Well, we yeah. should get to see that then if we're paying for it. That's yeah. why. That's why I... One Thursday. I, I loved think. it. Best job ever. It's yeah. great. Yeah, because I was 21 at the time, just left uni, dropped out of uni to be on CBBC. What were you studying at uni? Television studies. <laughs> the worst degree to study if you want to be on TV. They just make you watch episodes of Desmond's over and over again. It was just so weird. <laughs> It was a terrible, terrible degree. I hated it. And um, I just, the moment I, that one got to you, in it, babes? <laughs> just Desmond. Just Desmond. This is how, this TV, Desmond. No, just Desmond's, man. It was a good show. I was like, it was just crazy. And then I, I remember like being at uni and thinking like, I'm just going to get this degree, then go up to the BBC and be like, give me a job. And I'm so happy that I found comedy and I got in that way because I'd be working in Topshop right now, not going to lie. <laughs> so I'm really happy. But yeah. So how did you get into stand-up? You, you won the Funny Women in yeah. 2007? Nine. Nine, 2009. Yeah, I'd only been doing comedy for two months when I won. <laughs> right. Everyone else can suck a dick, bruv. I'm funny. <laughs> I was like... I was just, I actually only entered because I wanted to see women do comedy because I'd never seen women do comedy before. And Catherine Ryan won it the year before me. So Catherine Ryan gave me my award and she went on to do fuck all with her life. So <laughs> look at that. No, Catherine's great. Yeah, she gave me my award. It was crazy. It was hit. The semi finals was hit. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, 2009. And I remember just thinking, there's so many white people here. <laughs> and I've never done, because I was on the black comedy circuit, and I feel like people don't know that exists, but it's a circuit where Richard Blackwood is king, right? <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He is absolutely... And you just perform to black audiences in big spaces. And it's next level. Like, this shitty circuit. Oh, my God. <laughs> the black comedy circuit. If black people find you funny, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the slavery, but we have to just release it. Like, we have to laugh really loud. So I was doing gigs on the black comedy circuit, and they would laugh, throw chairs, be like, oh, my God, she's so funny. So I remember the first time I did a gig in front of white people, and they just laughed. And I came off stage like... I I died, man. <laughs> and everyone was like, no, you killed it. I was like, no one threw a chair, man. <laughs> I did, don't lie, man. I didn't do that well. No one threw a chair. They were like, they clapped. I was like, yeah, but no one threw a chair. <laughs> so I remember thinking, like, when I came here to do the semi-finals of Funny Women, I remember thinking, look, I just need one chair on stage, and I know I've got it, and no one threw a chair, and I got through to the finals, and I was in shock. I was just like, <laughs> oh, my God, I'm funny. Oh, my God. And then the, the final was at the comedy store, and again, like, same thing, killed it to pieces, <laughs> and then won the whole goddamn thing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then afterwards, everyone kept telling me I should go to Edinburgh, and I was like, why? What's... Like, I didn't know there was a thing there. I just thought, like... <laughs> I just, I just thought, I was like, why do all these people want me to go to Edinburgh? Like, well, you go to Edinburgh. Like, fuck it, I'm, I'm in Croydon. I'm fucking saying Croydon, okay? You go to Edinburgh. Like, I didn't, didn't realise there was a whole thing in Edinburgh called, like, they were just like, go to Edinburgh. I was like, you're a dickhead. So, but I actually went to Edinburgh and I was like, oh shit, this is a thing. Yeah. I had no idea. I was so new to the whole world of comedy before I won the final. That's movie. often a good thing. You know, it's often good to be doing your own thing, and you, you know, you don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, then, then you stand out. Exactly. I mean, funny women's are great. It was, you know, it's been going for a good long yeah. time now, and it's good that it's there, and it's it's paying the dividends. That, you know, I think there are back 10, 15 years ago there weren't too many female. No, comedians, now you know. there's loads. There there's still there were loads when I started, but I feel like more are on TV now, which is yeah. great. There still needs to be more work in that. Still a bit shit, but I'm trying to change that one yeah. step at a time. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying, guys. Well, what are you doing? I mean, you've been out to LA and it's exciting yeah. things that happened for you in LA. Yeah. I don't think you'll have to talk about it yet. Yeah, but... no. So basically, with LA, so what ha what had happened was what had happened was um, when I was like starting out, I just saw. So when I started comedy, I've been doing comedy ten years. When I started, Gina Yashray had just gone to LA, and she just left, and that was my only source of like black women in comedy. And she fucked off. So I was like, oh shit. And then Andy Osho was my homegirl for a bit. Then she fucked off. And I was just like, oh, who, who? And then Idris Elba went to my uni and he went to America and was in the wire and then got Lufa and everything was like amazing for him. But I remember before he went to America, he was in family affairs and no one gave a shit. <laughs> Idris Elba was in family affairs. <laughs> Idris, sexiest man on the planet, Elba was in family affairs and no one gave a shit. He went to America, got the wire, Lufa. No, you're not gonna do me like that. But I just thought America's the only way I'm gonna get famous in the UK because they don't give a shit about black people. So in the, head, in the back of my mind, I just knew that that was something I had to do. Yeah, but it's, tra you know, it's true, it's tragically yeah. true. I've mean, shown over and over again. And all, a, a lot of black actors, male and female actors are going to America. Oh my God. Being huge in America. Oh and, my God. And we're doing family affairs. Family affairs. In, in like, do you know how disrespectful that You're is? Lucky. We had Idris Elba in family affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Channel five. What? But um, I'm really good friends with Daniel Kaluuya, who's the star of Get Out and Black Panther and Widows. And he was like, go to America. And I was like, I'm going to see what you do first. I'll watch you. And then he went, boom. I was like, oh, shit, I need to go. And um, I was frustrated at that point, at a point because I couldn't get my own TV show. So I've never had my own TV show over here. I've nearly had my own show eight times. Right. Eight goddamn times. And I watched people that I started out with go on to be superstars. So I did a Radio 4 show um, as a sitcom that I wrote. It was just a pilot, but it aired on Radio 4. And I had to fight to get Ramesh Ranganathan to be in it because they were like, we don't think he's good enough. And I was like, he is, the, he needs to be in it. He's got talent. This is 2013. I was like, Ramesh has got something. Put him in it. Then he went on to be Ramesh. And I was like, oh God. Then Catherine was Catherine. I remember doing eight out of 10 cats tryouts with Josh Widdicombe and Josh being like, you're really funny, man. You'll get on this before I do. Then Josh got on it and I didn't. He became Josh. And Jack Whitehall, I remember him crying drunk at some place in Edinburgh. And I was like, who's this, oh, come here, who's this sad white guy? Come here, babe, come, 
And I remember like stroking his face, like, <laughs> why the fuck, who's this guy? And then my friend was like, that's Jack Whitehall. He's just had a scandal about him in the press about cocaine or whatever. I was like, oh, he'll never make it. Boom, he became a thing. <laughs> and so I remember watching every one of my like peers just be massive. And I was just like, I'm not going to be big here. I'm going to have to go there. And I was frustrated at the fact that no one would give me my own show. So I just wrote stuff. I wrote 25 sketches in three days. And um, uh, I was sleeping with this guy at the time who happened to be a cinematographer. And um, <laughs> I then made him my boyfriend. I, did, I slept with him first and made him my boyfriend. And then he filmed these sketches for me. I directed them and then I got my friends to be in them and I put them on YouTube yeah. and just put them out there so people could be like, if I die, people will know that I was fucking talented. Do you know what I mean? Like, people would be like, that London Hughes, we should have given her our own show. Like, I wanted that. So, so it's I, no filter. These it are was no called filter. No Filter, yeah. yeah. So I just put them out on YouTube um, two years ago right. and uh, an American company, management company, were just on YouTube, just clicking, living their best lives and they stumbled... <laughs> they... St clicking clicking and they stumbled across the videos and was like who's this amazing chick and I was like it's me and then <laughs> they signed me and I had to fly out to Beverly Hills to meet with them and then literally the shit that's happening for me now you ain't even gonna oh shit in hell my life has changed completely I've just came, I came back from LA yesterday and the stuff that's happening right now the, the, <laughs> the opportunities that I'm getting and the things that are about to happen for me Oh my God, I'm going to write a memoir. I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just gonna be like tales of a black girl that wasn't appreciated in her own town, had to go to LA and now everyone's on her dick. It's a good, that's, it's a good, it's a good title. That's the title, thank you. Title. Thanks, babe. But that's the, the title. The no filter thing is, you know, it's all there. You can, it's all up yeah, now, yeah, I was watching it today. There. And it's kind of interesting because it's brilliantly, they're, they're, it's beautifully shot now, I know why. Yeah. Uh, and it's... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes you've got to but, fake it till you make it. But they're I mean? lovely little sort of three, two or three minute vignette things and there's a beginning, middle and end and they're really well acted. There's lots, of, I mean, there's a lot of black actors in there. Yeah, because uh, I know about diversity. Yeah. <laughs> but you I would mean, think that the UK would be falling out. You know, they, they claim, you know, yeah. the TV claims they're falling over. It's so, bullshit. Oh, we need to find, but we can't find people. It's bullshit. And I feel like they just say it just to say it. Yeah, yeah. They don't actually want it because if they actually wanted it, it would happen. But it's just like, we need to be seen to be saying it because we're in a time where you can get called out for that kind of stuff. Yeah, often. sure. I mean, it's difficult. To, uh, you know, there's, it's a very competitive uh, market and it's yeah. a very, you know, very competitive job. And it's the kind of thing people get their feet under the table and it's hard yeah. to shift those people from, you know. So everyone's struggling a little bit. But you would, you know, everyone goes, oh, positive discrimination, you know. And there's all these people, you know, queuing up, waiting to be discovered. Oh, my God. And, like, literally. Yeah. Like, I've been here. I was like... I'm just waiting for everyone to figure out how awesome I am. <laughs> like, you know, when you just know that you're awesome and it's just like, you lot, hurry up, man, because I've got things to do. I've got my life to live. But they finally figured it out now and yeah. I'm fucking off. <laughs> like, it's always the way. But, but it's yeah. great that you, you know, it's great that you just put together and did those things. And yeah. They, they, you know, they, I don't know if they, they, they haven't had like thousands, no, and thousands of views. No, they haven't even had thousands, thousands of views. So there's quite low count, counts on those. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of think there's someone out there making all this stuff. Yeah. Showing you it's there. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's admirable, A, that you went out and just did it. And that is the way to you go just forward. Gotta get you gotta it out there. Go out there, keep working, keep working. But also, there's people producing the stuff that these are all little tiny short films. That's you know, what I'm they, saying. Yeah, yeah. So the talent is there. Like YouTube and everyone messaged me like, how do you make it on TV? How do you do this? I'm like, babes, when I started, there was no Instagram. There was barely Twitter, yeah. barely Facebook. Like, now, we've got the whole world. Like, how can I just... I wrote these sketches in my bedroom, like, watching Broad City and angry that we could never... There was no female equivalent of Broad City in this country, and there probably never will be. That's why they're bringing back Smack the Pony, because they just cannot make female content for some reason, even though Smack the Pony is amazing. But I remember just thinking, and typing all this stuff out, like, this will, this will show you. <laughs> and then now, I'm li literally... I'm literally, like... I oh, just living my best life. No, it's good. It's good. But that's yeah. you know, but that's what it's about, and that's that's. I don't know. It, it is. It's 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 interesting that that you you can make it by doing that, and then it's interesting that that's all it takes, even with something yeah. with three or five thousand views, which isn't it isn't a terrible amount. No, of but views, it's not massive. But it's, and then just the right person sees it, and then and you know, now the stuff can Yeah, I'm going back out in a um, couple of weeks to film a movie. So right. <laughs> life is all right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but it's all equally terrible that, that and you have been, you know, you've been around for a long time. Ten years. Yeah. 
Ooh. You've had about 10 different names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miss London Ms. in the London, beginning. Were, yeah. But I had to change the Miss London thing because there was actually like a Miss London pageant. Right. And the pageant, <laughs> the pageant winner was like, bitch, that's me. <laughs> I was like, that's you this year. I meet, I'm Miss London all the time. But um, I had to change it to just my name. So, yeah, because that way people weren't confused with me. Even though I am pretty enough to be a pageant winner, <laughs> I'm not a pageant winner. So, but yeah. Oh, terrific! Uh, well, it's very well. There's and there's lots of you've done. They've done a lot of a lot of weird stuff. A lot of you, weird stuff. I've done. I, what I really loved that was that series. It didn't get much um, uh, publicity at the time, I don't think. But bad bad bridesmaid. Bad bridesmaid. Which was, bad yeah, bridesmaid we watched that every rich. week because well, there was lots of people we knew on it, but there was. Oh but, you know, my god! That was a great show, mate. For that for that kind of show, mate. That was a great show. This is the thing about this is this is why this industry pisses me off. So there was a TV show called Bad Bridesmaid on ITV2, and it was a vehicle for young female talent. And it was where female comedians had to pretend that we were part of a bridal party. So the bride was in on it, but her bridesmaids weren't. And we had to go <laughs> go away. We had to go away with these brides and bridesmaids and stay with them for like three days and do like a Hindu with them. And we'd had to get the bride to do certain challenges. And she had to agree because if she got through, if she got through the whole Hindu and none of her bridesmaids figured out that we were imposters, she won a honeymoon. So she was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And the comedians on it were Annika Harry, Sarah Campbell, Anna Morris, um, I can't remember who else. Holly Byrne. Holly Byrne. And there was one more, there was one more, and I'm so terrible. Oh, me. Yeah, London Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> London Hughes. So, so, <laughs> so anyway, so imagine, so everyone else, this is, why it, this is why I feel like I go above and beyond for this industry, and it doesn't respect me, because, no, because listen to this. So everybody else, they had their characters, and they had to just pretend to be other people. But at that time in my career, I was quite kind of known because I used to do a lot of kids' TV. Yeah. So I couldn't pretend to be like Camilla Frush or something because <laughs> that was the name we're going to go, Camilla Frush. I couldn't be Camilla Frush because they might be like, isn't that that chick from kids' TV that gets gunged? Like that, <laughs> they might recognise me. Sure. So I was like, I'm just going to be myself. And I had to be like the most terrible version of myself. So I decided, I came up with a character where I was just really narcissistic, really like all about me, which is so hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just thought I was way more famous than what I was. So in every little thing we had to do, we went away in like some massive, estate thing and there was like horse riding and all that kind of stuff and I had to always panic because paparazzi were like always there <laughs> even though they weren't and um, I had to I had a lot of anxiety so I was like oh my god I've got anxiety I can't go bowling I've got anxiety and um, I was on the air diet so I couldn't eat around any of the girls so I just every time we had dinner I was like <laughs> and I had to convince And the thing is, it's so hard because that a show like that, when the camera's rolling, I can turn it on. But I had to keep the character up when the cameras weren't rolling. Actually, even more so, because every time the cameras went on, if I started going, <sighs> but in real life, I was cool, they'd suss it. So I was actually even more crazy behind the scenes. And then in shows like that, it's all hidden camera. Obviously, the camera crew and directors are in on it, but they've got to pretend that they're not. So any crazy thing I was doing, the director would be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what, we rehearsed this in my brain. <laughs> I'm like, no, but... The, it was such a, like, psychologically, it messed with me. Yeah, yeah. But what happened was, I knew I was a sick actress because I got to them girls so much that I got punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Punched in the face, Rich! They punched me in the goddamn face. <laughs> Let's be clear, they were from Hackney, so I expected that, but they punched me in the goddamn face, yes I did, yes I did. So the final, <laughs> after pissing them off for four days straight and just being so like, there was one point where we had to go, we had to play polo and I told the bride that I needed a back massage before the polo game and she was massaging my back and her, the, her Hindu were her cousins and sisters. So they were like, who the fuck is this chick? And why are you massaging her? Like what is going on? And then the final, final thing was we had to do a photo shoot and we all got given these dresses to wear and the bride, had free bridal gowns to choose from. And backstage, we were all getting, like, trying on the dresses, saying, I like this one, blah, 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 blah. And my, I had to put on the, the wedding gown and come out <laughs> for the photo shoot in the wedding gown. And then the bride had to be like, 
I had to say to the bride, can I wear this to the wedding? <laughs> and she had to say, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're all doing the shoot and then it's the final shots and I just put on this dreading gown and I remember every part of my body told me not to put this gown on. But, also, but I was like, you've got to do it for telly, you've got to do it for the industry, you've got to do it. Come on, you've got to do it. So I put this dress on and I came out and I was like, dun, 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 dun. and these girls just looked at me like, oh my God. What the fuck? And then the bride was like, her face, she was mortified. She's like, oh my God, London, what are you doing? I'm like, play along, bitch. So I was like, da, 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 da. And I was like, hey, honey, can I wear this to the wedding? And she was like, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> and her sister was like, what the fuck? No, she ain't wearing that to my fucking wedding. I'm tired of you. And, I, and my character was not confrontational, and which is even more annoying. So anytime the girls were mad at me, I had to be like, what do you mean? I, I just... I, it's just a dress, like it's just a normal dress. Like you guys are pretty, I look pretty. It was that kind of attitude and that pissed them off even more. Yeah. So the sister got in my face and she was like, you've been pissing me off for four days. Now you're gonna put this dress on. I was like, what, where's your problem with me? It's all love, babe. I go to give her a hug and she goes, bow in my face. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, oh my God. <laughs> but I had, I'm such a good actress. That I just held it down and I went, why did you hit me? <laughs> that was my response. And in my head I was going, it's gonna be great TV, same character, same character. And then ITV cut it out of the show because they said it would lower the tone of the show. <laughs> I got punched for nothing. <laughs> so I take, I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm so good. I'm punching your face yeah. good. That's like London Hughes, so <laughs> it's life, it's life. But yeah, it was such a good show and it aired um, in 2014. They didn't give it a second series, not quite sure why, but... Um, well, it's weird yeah. again because it was, it was a really good showcase for new comedians, female comedians, yeah. and, you know, and it was an incredibly difficult job because mm. you were, because exactly that, you were in character yeah. for three or four days. And because I was being me, yeah. it was even weirder. Yeah. Because if I was paying Camilla Frush, it'd be like, say we want about Camilla Frush, that's Camilla Frush. But they were talking to me. They were like, yeah. London Hughes, you're terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're horrible. And even before the reveal, because at the end, we revealed that it was all a joke and I'm an actress. And right before the reveal, one of the bridesmaids knocked on my um, hotel door and was like, basically had a go at me for an hour. Nice. And she basically was like, you're disgusting. I would never let my son watch you on TV. You're ugly. You're this, you're that, you're this. And I actually cried after she left. Oh, and the producers were like in the next room and they came in and they were like, you're all right. And I was like, I better get a fucking BAFTA for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember just being so upset. And I, they were like, keep it together. You've got an hour till the reveal. And when we, I revealed that it was all a joke, they didn't even believe me. I stood there and I was like, I'm an actress. They were like, sure, you're acting now. And I'm like, no, I am an actress. And even the bride was like, I've won a holiday, guys. Be happy. Like, she's an actress. And they were like, oh, my God, I'm so shocked. I thought you were really a dickhead. I was like, I'm not. <laughs> Just half a dickhead. Yeah, a little so, bit. But it was fun. I'm really Did they happy. say sorry for being no. mentioned? <laughs> They didn't even say sorry. They didn't even say sorry. That's how much I pissed them off. They were like, she deserved it at the time. So, yeah, show business. <laughs> well, it was, it was a really great show. It's a shame they didn't do more of those. But yeah. it's, 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 that's the way it is, isn't it? And it's, and it's a business that isn't, well, you know, you've had this experience where the, the makeup ladies didn't have makeup for you. Put hot chocolate so, on my face, Rich. Yeah. Do you know, you don't know this story? It was in, I did it, oh, mate. So I used to present CBBC, as you well know, because you know me now. And um, at the time, this was 2012, they didn't have makeup artists, like they didn't have one makeup artist, they had loads that just came through on rotation. Yeah. And one week, one of the makeup artists just didn't have any makeup for black people. And at the time, uh, we were at BBC Television Centre and the only, I'm on air at like 7.30 in the morning. So the only place that's open is Waitrose in Westfield. Yeah. And um, she, she realized I was black and then panicked. And instead of going, oh, I'll ring up a friend or a makeup artist friend and get some black makeup, or, you know, I'll just find some makeup from someone or buy some makeup from a shop. She was like, I know, I'll go to Waitrose, I'll buy hot chocolate powder and I'll put that on her face. And so she did that and I didn't know. So she was putting this powder on my face and I was like, oh, it smells, <laughs> it smells, it smells chocolate. -y. And she literally said, oh, well, it's called cocoa. And I was like, okay. And then she did it and I looked like one shade of gray. Like it was weird. It did not look good. And um, she left and I went through her makeup bag, which you're not supposed to do, but I was like, do you know what? Let me, I need to 
see. And I saw this tub of Waitrose Organic Hot Chocolate. And I was like, no, because she might just be thirsty. Let me clarify that that's what she put on my face. And so I went to the producer and I was like, can you please ask this woman what she put on my face? Because I look one shade of gollywog right now and I need to know. I can say it because I'm black, you can't do it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm allowed to say it. I was like, I need to know what she did. And yeah, she, she admitted it. She said she put hot chocolate on my face. She panicked. Yeah. She didn't have any makeup for black people. I mean, and, yeah, it I was, mean, it's yeah. terrible. I mean, it's terrible on every level, but just the fact that they, you're at the BBC. I know. And there wouldn't just be like one black person has no, come through at any point. That's the thing. But I, when I told the story, my friend Otis, who um, he's on the gadget show. Do you know Otis? Black guy, lovely man. Same thing happened to him. Right. So he was doing live and kicking and they put Tesco's hot chocolate powder on his face. Yeah. But they told him, but he's, he, at the time he was young and was like, hey, yeah, sure. They're like, you're so dark, Otis. I'm just gonna have to just put on the hot chocolate on your face. And he was like, all right. And so, it's, it's, what I'm saying, everyone's shocked. I'm like, no, but it's happened before. It's not even like crazy. It's happened to someone else that I know. So, yeah. At least you got Waitrose though. And I got Waitrose. <laughs> hey, I've made it. <laughs> Talk about an upgrade. I mean, go on, wait, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, you know, yeah. it's kind of unbelievable. It I mean, is. I believe you, but it's unbelievable. No, it is. But the thing is, I feel like it's unbelievable to people that don't think about those kind of things. Because yeah, you yeah. will never, you're obviously not a woman, but you would never I'm have never to think. I'm never on TV, so it's never an issue. <laughs> <laughs> but I do always eat my makeup off my face, so I'd love it if it happened to me. You'd never have to think about stuff no. like that. So that's why. And everyone's like, oh my God, I like. I can't believe that happens. Like, but you, but other black people are like, yeah, I can imagine that that happens because they have their own thing. So I always bring makeup to set now, wherever I go, just in case a bitch wants to put some hot chocolate on my face. <laughs> I can laugh about it now. But all that stuff happened. So much stuff like that happened. Like at the BBC, um, the, the Radio 4 show that I was telling you about with Ramesh, um, it was called 28 Dates Later, and the cast was me, Bronya Maguire, Humphrey Kerr, Arinze Kenny, and Ramesh Ranganathan. And the audience was really, like, it was radio theatre, sold out, crazy audience, crazy energy, big laughs, diverse audience. And I remember, like, finishing it and being so proud of, like, the reaction. And even the people that worked at Radio Theatre were like, I've been here 20 years and I've never heard laughter that loud. Because usually it's, like, middle class, now show laughter, like, hoo 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 Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's it. Ooh. That kind of thing. <laughs> it was that kind of, that's what they used to, that kind of laughter. Yeah. But the laughter was like, because I'm so funny, the laughter came from the gut and everyone was like roaring with laughter. And then afterwards, my producer at the time, who worked at the BBC, she's a great woman, she was on my side, but <laughs> after the reaction, um, these BBC execs were like, oh my God, London, the reaction from the crowd was amazing. Like, you must be so proud. And my producer, the woman who's on my side, white woman, older white woman, but still lovely, she turned around and said, oh yeah, but that's because black people are loud and the whole audience were pretty much black. So it's just what, that's why. <laughs> and like, the, first of all, the audience were diverse. So it wasn't just like a whole black audience. And also, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> so then the execs, the BBC execs looked at me like, oh my God, did she really just say that? And this is someone on my team yeah, so yeah. i had to just be like yeah us black folks be loud <laughs> that's that's what we do we're just so loud literally yeah. well it's you know but it's uh, it's they won't have had any experience yeah. so they're sort of these awkward white middle class people yeah. tr probably trying to say the right thing and then but thing is, some black really people are saying loud. the wrong thing but some black know. people are loud but not all of us are no, loud no, no, so no, like, you can't, just so you, you know can't. like we're not all loud. I am. <laughs> but we're not all loud. But yeah, so stuff like that, having meetings where you just go to meet someone at, for a, a TV exec or whatever, and they go and greet you with a fist bump instead of a handshake, and you're just like, what the hell? Give me my reparations. What's happening? <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on, Britain? What the fuck is going on? So yeah, racism. No, I wouldn't even call it full-on racism because I don't believe that people are racist. It's just get more black friends. Get some funny-tinged <laughs> friends, guys. <laughs> Shit here now. We all need a funny-tinged friend. Everyone needs a funny-tinged friend. Everyone. Jesus. How many funny-tinged friends you have? Like so many. Uh, are you sure? Yeah. Rich, <laughs> am I your only funny-tinged friend? I don't have any friends. I don't have any white <laughs> friends. Get some funny-tinged friends, man. You have to. 
Uh, Carton Dixon was in uh, someone who Richard not Judy. He's he was funny. Oh really? Um, <laughs> so I'm all, I'm fine. No, he, was, he was very loud. Very loud. He was very loud. Shit. <laughs> So you do do a lot about dating. Yeah. And you, I mean, it's, you know, you're a young woman. It's Yeah. So you, you're also on Celebs Go Dating. Yeah. That, that's a real... That was mental. That's reality, right? Yeah. Reality I've always TV. wanted to do reality because I auditioned yeah. for Big Brother and I feel like I'd be good at reality. And so when Celebs Go Dating were like, we want her, I was like, yes, pay me to date white guys on TV. Yes, <laughs> of course I'll do that. Free food and everything, of course. So I went there and I am single and I am single. And every day is an opportunity to catch a dick. So I'm just, you just gotta, let, you just gotta say it. You gotta let it out that my man might be here. So you just let it out. So I'm single. And I went on the show thinking that I could find love, could catch a dick, could get more famous. It was so much things, so much pluses to do in yep. that show. It was crazy though. Reality TV is insane. All reality TV stars are mental. They all <laughs> should see therapy and they are horrible people. And I'm, I'm classed with them now. I get papped and shit. Like if I tweet something, it's in the Daily Mail. If I go to an event, I'm getting papped. It's crazy. Yeah. I love it. I love, <laughs> I love it all. But it is, it's very non-comedic, because comedic, like, look at James, like, James, I asked James to come to an event with me, um, like, to get papped, and he literally nearly choked on his tongue. He was like, I'm not doing that. Like, he, he's just, like, the cool comedian. And I'm like, everybody look at me, comedian. It's just a weird thing. But I love well, it. Yeah, there is a kind of, there, there, there might be a little bit of snobbishness in that area, into, yeah. in, you know, in some of the stand-up. Oh, stand-ups stand -ups. are fucking snobby as fuck. Yeah. I hate them. No, they're all right. Do you know what? I think it's just... Do you know what it is? It's just middle, it's just middle class bourgeois beige bullshit. And then there's like some cultural droppings of awesomeness. But mainly comedy in Britain is just middle class bourgeois bullshit. Yeah, so fuck whenever... Me. Yeah. Fuck, fuck them all. So whenever someone like me comes along, it's like, oh, she's so refreshing. Because you're so used to the same bullshit. Does but that I make think sense? That, you know, but you are, you're, you are unusual in that, in the, you know, this... Confidence and you know in the, the in your face thing. Yeah. It, you know I think it, I think maybe it, 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 there's a, it sort of is off putting to some people. Why maybe. would that be off putting? Well, because people. Are, what people do you are, mean? Are, this is what I'm saying. Are, off putting. Off putting. I'm a queen. People, Rich, I'm not having it. I'm not having it. Not to me. No, I need London. a drink. He said that was off putting. Not to that me. That is ridiculous. I'm it a, is ridiculous. I'm a queen. You would love. Bruv, would you be intimidated by me? I'm not. In, I'm not. In, <laughs> I'm not Rich. To some Rich. people, they, you know. Me! I guess. I I'm guess, charming! I don't understand! <laughs> this is what I'm saying. This is the British thing. This is why I'm fucking single. Because I'm off putting. I'm, this, is, this is awesome. I'd love it if I, um, I met me as a man. Oh my God! Do you know what I mean? All these, thank you! All these I, basic bitches just with their meh, meh, meh. And you've got me, you know. I'm not Me. saying. I'm not saying it's their problem, not your problem. But this is the thing. It's that's the British thing. Is like, yeah. oh, she's she's a woman who's confident and loud. So it's like, ah, my penis is shrinking. No, <laughs> your penis should be standing fully erect. <laughs> <laughs> that is what's wrong with men these days. It's a, it's fully as erect, erect as it all go. That's that's what it's as, Jesus. That's, that's as far as it goes now. This is what should be happening, Rich. Fully erect. Well, I don't. I don't. But I don't. I've always loved funny women. I've always loved confident women, and I've never understood that when they say women who are funny don't get yeah. guys. Because if I was a dude, oh my! Have you seen? All right. So most of the comedians out there, and they're not all that fit. Yeah. You should see their wives and girlfriends. <laughs> Fucking hell! <laughs> they are stunning. They are. Have you seen? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Katie? She's oh. You're punching. You are punching. That's what I'm saying. Like these. these these average looking to ugly comedians with these stunning. <laughs> these stunning, these stunning, awesome, skinny, beautiful, model, smart, intelligent, amazing wives and girlfriends and baby mothers. And then there's like awesome people like me. <laughs> and we're just like, just single. Like, yeah, it's just sad. It's you should be sad. single. You should be single for now. I mean, it's... You think so? Yeah. Well, look, A, you want to get, have a yeah. stand -up career. You want to go to LA. Yeah. You don't, a man would hold thing. me back in it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, you're young. You want to yeah. enjoy yourself. You want to enjoy... You know, I think yeah. you do probably enjoy yourself. Yeah, I, I do. Mean. And I have a lot of sex as well. And yeah, that would so probably... That's, that's, 
Yeah. That's what I was going for. Gotta get mine. <laughs> Gotta sit on a couple faces a week. So that's how. That's how you get the blood flow going. Gotta sit. That's how I'm funny. It's powered by face sitting. That's what. <laughs> Rich, I'm having a good time. I'm having a real good time, Rich. I'm having I'm a great having time. I'm having a good time too. Yeah, it's right. great. Isn't... <laughs> I'm, enjoy I'm enjoying myself. This I is feel fun. like Lembert Opic right now. <laughs> Who actually asked me for my number? Did he? That yeah. surprised me. What a surprise. Yeah. He actually did. It was amazing. <laughs> it's got such raw energy, that man. Well. It's crazy. <laughs> crazy. He was in a terrible hang gliding accident. What a shame. Uh, but uh, it's a shame. It's a shame for that's awful. It's awful to happen to anyone. Um, I'll, I'll ask you some emergency questions. Not that we need them, but let's see where we go. Let's see where we go. Um, oh, well, well, this is opened up at... Uh, oh, I'll ask you this about... Uh, no. What is it? It follows on. Um, this comes from a... a, a I was talking to Richard Osman, who does World Cups of things. I like him. He's lovely. He's a good man. Uh, He's a huge fan of mine. Yeah, he's he actually, randomly he actually yeah. is. <laughs> Bless him. Um, I proposed a World Cup of STDs to. Ah, stop! <laughs> no. Which STD would win a World Cup of sexually transmitted diseases? Would win. win? Yeah. Which is the best? I feel like AIDS, AIDS would win, but it would lose because you'd be dead. Yeah, I mean, I would say. <laughs> like. I'm going to say... You can look at it both two, two ways. You can say which is the worst yeah. sexual transmission or gonna, which I'm, is the best sexual transmission. I'm going to say herpes. Herpes, yeah. Yeah, fling out herpes. Because... It never goes away. It never goes away and it comes, comes back. Yeah. So... To remind you. That you have her. Well, do yeah. you know? I wouldn't know. No, I know. Uh, I, I know all about... Uh, do, really? I was in a sex education film when I was 14. <laughs> it was called Swings and Roundabouts. <laughs> And uh, there's a yeah. <laughs> and there's a there's a show that I'm on on Channel Four about sex education, and you know when you watch celebrities on TV and they show you a thing of before you were famous. I remember watching celebs on TV as a kid, and they'd be like, "This is you before you were famous," and they'd show a clip of them auditioning for some bullshit, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, I can't wait till I'm famous and that happens to me." Well, it happened to me. <laughs> so I was on this sex education show for Channel Four, just talking, and they showed us clips of old sex ed videos throughout time. Some of them are terrible. And then they showed me mine. And I was like, oh my God. And I'm 14. And I literally, the, the fucking comedy in me, even in a sex education <laughs> film, I'm funny. I'm so funny. Like I'm 14 and there's one line where I'm sitting on a bench and this girl, she's just like had unprotected sex. And I literally look at her and I'm, I'm, I'm the good one in the, in the, in the sex education film. She's just had it in the, just had unprotected sex yeah, in so, front of you. No, no, no. So... The storyline was like, to make it relevant to kids. Yes, okay. So I was, I, I moved, my mum bought a hotel in Brighton when I was 14. So I grew up in Brighton. And now there's nothing to do but fucking have babies in Brighton. And that's what everybody was doing. So they made a sex education film relatable to the youth. So obviously I wanted to be famous. So I got myself involved in that. And my character didn't have sex, but she was like the moral compass. And I was chatting to this girl. She just had sex. She felt down We're on a park bench. And she's like... Oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to the clinic um, to make sure I, she wants to get the morning after pill because yeah. he came inside her. Do you know what I mean? So she went and got. They'll do that. He, she went and got the morning after pill. <laughs> she went and got. <laughs> what does that even mean? Bitch? <laughs> I've got visual images of you right now. Oh, I don't want to have. So she was like. So she's upset and she's like, oh, I'm going to go get the morning after pill. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, there's something else. What is it? ABC? DVD? <gasps> STD! <laughs> and literally the comedy timing <laughs> at 14 was just immaculate. And I watched it back like, I'm a, I'm a fucking genius. Even then. Like, and it's good. It's coming out on Channel 4 maybe in a couple months. You can okay. see my reaction to seeing me before. It was great. <laughs> but um, I didn't learn that much from that, really. Yeah. But yeah, STDs are a thing. Good. They are a thing. And yeah. do watch out for them. Just wear a Johnny. I know that you want to ask me more questions on this book. Yeah. But I, need, I want to talk about something. You can. You can talk about everything. Can I? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about this. Do you know about the Whoopi Goldberg thing? Uh, yes. Yeah. Talk about this, actually. Yes. Yeah. I was going to get onto that. Yeah. Oh, no, let's, audience, do you want more questions? Or do you no, want to hear about the Whoopi Goldberg Whoopi thing? Goldberg. Do you want to hear Whoopi Goldberg thing? Okay, so I thought you'd ask me about this, but you haven't. I haven't, so, yeah, I was saving up. Oh, would you actually? No, that's right. It's oh, good. babe, I'm sorry, do no, your job. Like, do you know what you asked what me? With, uh, <laughs> you know what I'd love to see is you travelling around the world with Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, well, I'm glad you asked that question, Yeah, Mitch. good. 
So I've got a story about that. So, <laughs> so last year, um, I, uh, I had loads of meetings about having a TV show and I really wanted a female-led travel show because that would be amazing and there aren't any. And I was like, let's just do one. And then the company I worked with were like, who would you love to do one with? And I just said, Whoopi Goldberg, like you would say Beyonce. Do you know what I mean? And they were like, okay, cool, we can make that happen. And they contacted Whoopi. Whoopi said yes. So most of the time when you make TV shows, the talent is the last to happen. Like you get the TV channel interested and then we say, we can try and get Whoopi Goldberg and you fight for that, which is crazy. But in this situation, we got Whoopi. So Whoopi was on board. So Whoopi said yes to doing this TV show with me and it would be me and Whoopi going to America, traveling around. And I want to be, I want to be her because she's the only black female household name in comedy, only full stop. You could say Whoopi and Basildon, Whoopi and Skegness, they'll know who the fuck you're talking about. She's the only black chick that you can, on that level. Mm -hmm. And since her, there's been nothing. It's been a big 20 year gap of nothing. So I was like, as a kid, I want to be Whoopi. And the dream is still to be as big as her. So to do a show with her, I'm like, oh my God. And a travel show as well. And me and Whoopi getting drunk on tequila shots and just living our best lives. And her giving me like, like you know, mentoring and just funny shit. So anyway, we got the TV, we got Whoopi, we got the production company. All we had to do now is get a channel involved, which should be easy. <laughs> no. No, no channels wanted it. Like, no channels. Like, none. And let's be clear, Russell Howard and Mum was on its fifth series. On <laughs> Ramesh Ranganathan's mum gets more work than me, trust me. Bradley Walsh has got a show with his fucking son. But nobody wanted me and Whoopi. So, after, like... I don't even know, like, what your brain does when you find out you've got a show with Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg's agreed to be in a show with you, but nobody wants that show. It's mental. I'm surprised I didn't, like, drink myself into depression. I was just like, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe this. This was last year. So like, I cannot believe I had a show with Whoopi Goldberg and nobody wants to make that show. What the fuck? So then I let it go. But then on New Year's Day, <laughs> Sister Act was on. <laughs> and I'd had four Baileys. <laughs> and you know when you just want to express yourself? So I was like, I was like, you know, oh, fuck it. I remember picking up my phone <laughs> with the Baileys in my hands, and like watching Sister Act being like, I just think it's funny how in 2017, no, 2018, <laughs> me and Whoopi had our own TV show she agreed to do a travel show with me and no TV channels wanted it. In the future, can we have more female-led travel shows and not just comedians and their mums? And that tweet went viral. <laughs> and um, it blew up. And next thing you know, all other female comedians were coming forward like, I pitched a show and they said no. Julie Yashere pitched a show and they said no. Um, uh, Tiffany Stevenson had a show and they pitched a show and they said no. And then... We worked out, Tiffany wrote down every single male comic that had their own travel show. And it was like, fuck loads. And it was just like, male comics and their friends, male comics and their mums, male comics and their dads. And it was just like, all this stuff. And then the only female comic was Susie Perkins. Yeah. Once, one time. And everyone was like, oh my God, this is insane. Like, what's going on? And so... Basically, that tweet spurred people getting upset and realising how TV works. Because everyone's like, oh, what's all this shit on TV? And it's like, we try and make shit for you, then the people in charge decide whether or not you guys want it. And that's bullshit. So I was like, let me see if the people want it. And the people wanted it. They were up in arms. And then next thing you know, The Guardian were doing interviews. <laughs> and um, now, all of a sudden, people are interested in the show with me and Whoopi Goldberg. Well, it's, it's, so, uh, um, yeah. It's extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. I was actually, funny enough, I talked to this, I was talking to my wife about this on Valentine's Day. Oh, of course. We had, like, we had, like, not quite an argument, but over our Valentine's dinner. Because I was saying that, like, the travel shows are the ones that they do give to established people. So they go, it's an easy, it's an easy, from their point of view, it's an easy TV show. Yeah. So you go, you get someone established and you yeah. send them somewhere and then people, they know people will watch. Yeah. So I was saying, like, for some people, like, if that, to pitch that... That's a bit of a stretch because you're going when you're not yet well known and you're saying let's do this travel show. But I said I can't believe Whoopi, they, they had yeah. Whoopi Goldberg who is better than, than Jack, Jack Whitehall and, yeah. or you yeah, know of or whoever. And Joel and, and I love Jack Whitehall. The world, and I love them. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's a proper Hollywood. Yeah, I mean I know like. You're saying it's 20 years, 30 years, but her career's still going. Yeah, she's she's still, but they. And, do you know what? A lot of the comments were Whoopi Goldberg's not relevant enough. 
Like, that's crazy. Like, this is what I'm saying. This is why Netflix does so well, because Netflix just puts out everything and we decide whether it's a hit. Whereas TV, we're coming up with all these ideas and the people in charge who have no experience in comedy and a lot of them genuinely don't have friends and they're just weirdos. <laughs> and they're just like, I don't like it, so other people won't like it and that's that. Well, they're scared. They're, that's the problem. And it's, th that's a problem. I'm not saying they're right about even like, so, you know, Tiffany Stevenson would do a great travel show. Yeah. Right, but that they're scared. So they're scared that... That's what are why, they scared that's of, what, Rich? Well, they're scared what that are they, they scared of? They're scared that they'll commission something and no one will watch it and they'll But that happens with dudes all the time. Yeah. Who the fuck yeah. watches anything? Like, so many shit TV shows involving dudes happen. I'd rather a shit TV show with a chick like, we took a risk. None of you yeah, bitches of were risking shit. Do you know what I mean? Well, like, I'd every rather that. Every successful TV show is someone taking a risk. And on all the stuff that doesn't do very well is stuff people going, let's copy that other thing. So yeah. ne nearly, nearly every time. And so it's, and that's why panel shows are all the same people because they go, oh well, we know they work, they know, well, they and dare we risk putting yeah. even one new person? Oh in my every god, show, I've auditioned you know? for eight out of ten cats three times, and when you audition for eight out of ten cats, yeah, like you think you could just be like they just give it to you. No, you've got to like first of all, you've got to do a run through in front of all the producers of like Channel Four or whatever who make the show, and then you've got all the other comedians and you're doing a run through of the show, and everyone's trying to be funny. Then if you get through to that round, you do it all again with Jimmy Carr as the host, and if you get through that, then you get on the show. Three times I've got through to the Jimmy Carr round of that, and every time they say, "Oh, we love London, we just don't think our audience would get her." But then the basic dudes that maybe said one or two jokes that are just like just safe, relatable white dudes, they always make it on the show. And it was a ridiculous time of me watching all my friends go on the show and being like, if I'm not good enough, then that's one thing. But don't tell me I'm good enough and then say their audience, just take a risk. And they'd always say, oh, if London's famous in her own right, then she can get on the show. So instead of me, they had like Jamelia. And it's just like, what is it that, why are you guys scared? It's just television. And I was on Mock the Week and I fucking killed that shit. So it's kind of like, you could take a risk on eight out of 10 cats does countdown. Like, do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, but they There's should so do. many politics in this industry. It is, but, but those programs in themselves are sort of quite safe. And you know, like, yeah. it, let's do another panel show. Let's do, you know, they're not taking those chances. But I feel like they have quirky white dudes though. They'll have like, yeah. The w weird but, but white guys it's, doing weird it's, shit. It's insane because I know everyone will say if you're on something, people will go, "Oh, positive discrimination! Oh, they put one person in." Oh yeah, and and, and, and yet. You know, it's like to say that Romish and Nish are the only two funny exactly, Asian people exactly, in the country. Exactly. That doesn't make sense. Or Catherine's that the only funny work. woman yeah. in the in the country. And so it's kind of crazy if that was the even if it was you know half the amount of people it should be. It yeah, be, it it's be just that. Like even yeah. with me, every time I've got anything, everyone thinks, "Oh, I'm like the token, or I don't deserve to be there." And I'm like, you need to understand one how hard it is for women in comedy anyway. On top of that, I'm a black woman in comedy and I've been on TV for 10 years. I have to be good to be on TV for 10 years being a black woman in this country because we make up like 3% of the country and less than 1% of television. So if I'm that chick that's been on TV for 10 years, best believe I'm good at what I do. So, <laughs> thank you. So it's like, for me, when they say stuff like that, my friend Gronya Maguire, she always says like, male comedians, they get opportunities because they've got potential. Female comedians get opportunities because they have experience. So most female comedians don't make it until they're like mid thirties because they've done enough to warrant the opportunities that they're getting. And it's like, nah, I was funny then, I'm funny now. Hurry up before I leave for America, babe. Do you know what I mean? So hopefully, I always speak out about stuff like this anytime I can because I feel like people need to under I love TV. I'm such a fan of TV and I want TV to be a massive thing. I don't want Netflix to take over TV. I miss the days when you'd run home and just watch Gladiators or some shit. Do you know what I mean? Like the good old days when you're all around the TV watching Blind Date and like back in the day to be on TV you had to be talented. Like Cilla Black could sing and dance. Bruce Forsyth could sing and dance. Even Michael Barrymore's out here singing and dancing. He's just a presenter. And I was just like now you've got these reality TV stars that are just there for just being there yeah, yeah. and like no one has that like that you know that performance ethic anymore like oh I'm gonna come and smash TV and be an entertainer and I still got that shit in my soul <laughs> so anytime I can and I feel there's an injustice especially with women in comedy and entertainment I have to say some shit yeah, so yeah that's see. my serious part of this podcast <laughs> <laughs> but it's good and what was amazing about that, that that tweet was the way that it you know just that 
it wasn't something that people had really said very much, but then this just explosion yeah. of everyone agreeing with you all these all the you know this is of anger about it and of uh, the injustice of it and i think then it does permeate through you know that's the thing and that's when they that's when everyone then goes oh shit yeah you know, and now my agent's <laughs> getting calls like oh we're deciding to do an all female led travel show my agent's like yeah i wonder why <laughs> like my client started that shit but it is it is what it, i'm happy that the tweet went viral i'm happy that people are understanding that there are it, it's just it's not fair it's so one-sided and there's so much work to do but hopefully now if this whoopee show gets made it's had it's got interest from itv um they are they are interested in it right now so if that gets made hopefully people will be like actually this is good so other shows that are with women in it aren't so much as a risk anymore yeah well i, th I think that's hopefully the way it's going to go although you know it's it's such a you know tv as you say might very well be irrelevant yeah it will be but i feel like if people don't give the people what they want, like a yeah. variety of shit, then of course it will be. That's why Netflix is so good. But I just want, I don't know, the young girl in me, I always wanted to be like the, a black, the black girl I never saw on TV. I didn't see black girls on TV because Desmond's was, um, <laughs> Desmond's was before my time. So um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I didn't, but the first black person I saw on TV was Angelica Bell on CBBC. And she made, seeing her on CBBC made me want to be a CBBC presenter. So I got that, tick, did that at 21. And the next black woman, Whoopi Goldberg. So now I'm doing a show with her, tick. Yeah. So it's just kind of like, that I'm trying to just, yeah, I'm just trying to be the funny black chick I never saw on TV that I still don't really see on TV. So, yeah, apart yeah. from myself. Oh, I'm on TV tonight. You're missing it. <laughs> there you go. I'm on TV. You lot, when you get home, go on and catch up and watch the stand-up sketch show, 10 p.m. Oh, ITV2. Yes. That's on now. What time is it? <laughs> it's on now. I'm it's on, on TV now. now. <laughs> Look at that. Go and put the telly Go on when you get it. home, watch it. <laughs> 10 p.m. ITV2. I'm very funny in it. So I have a feeling, London, that... We're going to be seeing a bit more of you. Thanks, Rich. What, because um, we're going to be friends in real life? Yeah, no, not us. <laughs> no, I'll never see you again. Uh, and, uh, but that will, be, that will be your choice. I'll be ringing up being, please come on now, you're really famous. No, no Richard, I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> I've got a new show coming out. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but I'm going to... Um, when does this podcast It'll end? be a couple of months. Oh, you? great. So there's a show that I'm doing. They won't tell anyone. I mean, please do. I want. That's why, that's why I'm telling them. Okay. I want you to. So there's a show on ITV called All Star Musicals, where oh, yes. celebrities take on famous musicals, perform it at the London Palladium, and the judges are like Elaine Page, Kristen Chenoweth, and the big genie in Aladdin, that funny singing, all singing black guy who I love. And we're we're I'm rehearsing for that now. Great. And so that comes out on the eighth. No in March, mid-March. Yeah. And the, the other celebrities, they don't know what's hit them because they got me to do it. <laughs> so like, I'm going up against Alan Titchmarsh. What? <laughs> Come on. What's, he, what, what's Alan Titchmarsh got on me? <laughs> Alan Titchmarsh gonna be shaking in his boots. There he is. Um, Alan Titchmarsh, the ju what's her name? Raquel from that, what's that show with Raquel? Only Fools and Horses. Yeah, Raquel, she don't know. <laughs> Tessa, her name is in real life. Raquel, yeah. Raquel, yeah? And then some chick from Emmerdale, some dude from Coronation Street, and Joel Domit. <laughs> <laughs> and I am going to win that show. And when it comes out, I want you to remember this conversation. I want you to just send positive vibes. I don't know if it's an audience vote or if it's an audience in the Palladium, but I don't even know. But I need to win. Okay, guys? So positive vibes. You'll never beat Titchmarsh. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> You've got but no I'm chance. doing I'm doing Chicago. I'm doing okay. Roxy full on dance number, <laughs> being funny and great. And um, I'm really excited about that because it's like primetime ITV, and I've never been on primetime ITV before. So hopefully, when that show airs, it does wonders for me, and people go, "Oh, she's not a risk anymore. She's an all round entertainer. <laughs> she can sing and dance and be fit." So that's. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully I'll catch a dick and then everything That'd will work out for me. Oh, you're going to catch a few. Uh, Thanks, it's, uh, Rich. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you, Rich. Uh, <laughs> London Hughes, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you.
How do you like them Sky potatoes? <laughs> 